Thank you very much, Dr. von Grimmer, about this uh, warm introduction here to the cold Washington. Uh, very happy to be here at this International Food Policy Research Institute, and you will understand later on why this institute is very close to my heart. Uh, but I will come to this subject a little bit later on. Uh, I have been asked, uh, and I have given the opportunity, I would say, to talk to you about uh, a subject that has been growing in interest over the last couple of years, and one that is, I believe, also undergoing a fundamental transformation. And it's a topic that goes under many, many names, uh, perhaps most frequently, I would say, under the name of corporate social responsibility, CSR. And the reason for this is that many more businesses are recognizing that they can only have a long-term success if they're able to create value for the shareholders and for the society at large at the same time. And this is one of the central lessons one would hope that business has learned from the recent financial crisis. But it is also for a fundamental change in the meaning of the societal responsibility of business. Let's not forget the context of today at this point of time. The key element of the Institute's mission is to achieve sustainable food security and to reduce poverty in developing countries, if I have read carefully the mission statement of IFPRE. Now, this is not just a mission of fundamental interest to Nestle as a major food manufacturer. Global food security will be, in my personal opinion, one of the defining issues of the first half of this century. As we know, unfortunately, still today, more than one billion people worldwide go to bed hungry every single night. 200 million more people experienced malnutrition since the end of 1990s. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is an enormous reversal and it's a big a shake to the, to the Millennium Development Goals, as we all know. And you can see here where the goals were and what we wanted to achieve, and you see on the charts what we are achieving. For 30 years, we have been able to improve, to diminish hunger in the world, and over the last couple of years, unfortunately, we have again increased part of the population who has to go to bed hungry. And every day, the global demand for food increases while the growth in our agricultural productivity per hectare goes down. I always keep in mind these two figures. Every second, and we know how fast a second is, every second, two more people to be fed. Every second, 0.2 hectare of arable land being lost due to erosion and urbanization. That's a reality. It's a very simple one. But it, I think it exemplifies well what the big challenge it is. And the result is that the growth in food production is not keeping up with the growth in population growth and demand. And the declining av availability of water is a fundamental factor in the food security dilemma. The goal we must achieve, feeding the population of this world, is becoming more and more difficult to attain. And as a result, it will take the concerted action of multiple, multiple sectors to avoid a serious crisis in food availability for humankind. And I think food security has great relevance to today's topic, because if businesses and especially, of course, food companies, do not think long-term and look at the macroeconomic and social impacts of food security on society, how they can play their part with other actors to impact it positively, we will all be hard-pressed to satisfy, at the same time, our shareholders, but, as I said before, also the society's demands. For me, food security is one of the most promising fields in which I believe that the creating shared value concept can deliver real and tangible benefits. 
and where it can genuinely deliver more than some other concepts about the role of business in society. Corporate social responsibility has been traditionally viewed as a public company moral obligation to give back to society. Some years ago, we spent at Davos, at the World Economic Forum, five days on corporate social responsibility. And at the end of these five days, every single person, the 1,000 representative of the biggest company of the world, we are convinced that we have to give back to society. And I had to stand up at the last session and I said, I'm very sorry, I have nothing to give back to society because I have not been stealing anything from society. Because I think you give back something if you have taken it away in, an un, uh, in, in a manner which is not correct. And this public, uh, this public company's moral obligation to give back to society took in many cases the form of philanthropic donations. Apparently, by writing a sizable check for any charitable activity, a company compensated for something negative it has created by running its day-to-day -day activities. That was the only explanation I had to this time. And one could be forgiven for believing that in these times of economic downturn, this has never been more important. Despite more encouraging signs recently, the past two years have seen millions facing job losses, high debt burden, and general insecurity. And at the same time, the same economic forces we are producing this crisis places a tremendous and tremendous pressure on companies to cut costs, including, for example, by cutting their charitable donations. So according to Giving USA, such gifts were down 14.5 billion US dollars in 2008 alone. So may I ask you, how sustainable is this corporate social, social res, uh, responsibility concept to equate the level of a company's responsibility to society with the size of the check that it writes, especially when it is a publicly listed company and that money that is given as charitable philanthropy in reality doesn't belong to the CEO, it belongs to the shareholders many of whom have their selves feeling the bite of the recession and have the need. So there is, in my point of view, a big question mark whether this concept of corporate social responsibility can really be sustainable in the long term. And this widespread interpretation of corporate social responsibility is always based on one presumption, that business is basically a negative force in society and needs, therefore, to show improvement all the time. So fewer emissions, f less packaging, fewer strikes, fewer accidents. Quite a few uh, corporate social responsibility reporting standards have emerged in this vein, nearly all of them starting from this essentially negative premise. But I ask you, if you are always trying to prove you are less bad, where is the incentive to excel rather than to just mitigate risk? Now make no mistake, Nestle does not shirk its duty in this respect and, and sets itself exacting standards in improving, for example, its environmental sustainability performance. We see our role in this corporate social responsibility starting with compliance, compliance with the local and the international laws, norms, and business principles, which is an essential foundation for the way we see our role in society, no doubt about it. But I don't think it's enough. Compliance is just a minimum expression of a full pyramid of values. The next given in today's world, frankly speaking, is a deep commitment to the environmental sustainability. In short, to ensuring that we provide for the needs of today without compromising those of future generations. And we can be proud what we have achieved. 
As part of our own environmental commitment, we have reduced, for example, gas, house, gas emissions by almost half. And in order to put our environmental performance figures into perspective, I would like to add that our production at the same time increased by 68% over the last 10 years. And we have many, many ways in achieving that. In Nescafe factories, from mines in Germany to Buga La Grande in Colombia, for example, we are using the spent coffee grounds to supplement and replace the traditional fuels. In our Graneros factory in Chile, for example, we have switched from coal to natural gas and sold the carbon credits to Japanese companies. So we are very interested in the, in the whole carbon emission credit system and, and, and exchange system because for us it's one way to have additional, as the additional income. But in both of those things, it's not just society that benefits from our environmental standards. Of course, it's society first and environment. But once again, it's a great win-win situation. And as a business that is reliant along the entirety of its value chain upon high-quality agricultural raw materials and sufficient water resources, our long-term success is dependent on a clean environment and sustainable use of resources. That's why it is good for us in the long term. For Nestle, our challenge is to move even beyond playing the role of a good corporate citizen. Those were the first and the second level of our responsibility. Instead, we are trying to create a fundamental connection between the shareholder value and the societal value. And we need to integrate the improvement of the lives of families, workers, communities in, into our core business strategy. It should not be something which is add on or which is apart from. It has to be an integrated part of our business strategy. And this is why when others talk about corporate social responsibility, Nestle concentrates on an approach we call creating shared value. And allow me to expand on what we understand by that. It is clear that any business that thinks long term and follows sound business principles creates by its activity value for society and for shareholders through its activities. For example, in terms of jobs for workers, taxes that are being paid to support public services, and the economic activity in general. But ladies and gentlemen, at Nestle, we believe that creating shared value goes one step further. What creating shared value means is that a company consciously analyzes and identifies areas of focus where shareholders' interest and society's interest strongly intersect and where value creation can be optimized for both. Not all of activities. All of activities, they are in one way or the other, they are good for both if they are well done. But here we're talking about analyzing your value chain from R to Z and to identify those areas where the optimization can be achieved between the values creation for society and for the shareholders. And as a result, the company invests resources, both in terms of talent, people, and capital, in those areas where the potential for joint value creation is the greatest and seeks collaboration with relevant stakeholders in society. Now, at Nestle, we looked at our specific case, and basically we identified three areas where this can be best achieved. And those areas are water, rural development, and nutrition. For our company, every single company has to do the job and has to see where there are the areas where this can be optimized. Now, <coughs> these activities are core to our business strategy and operations, and we have joint programs with over 100 organizations around the world in these three areas. And why? Well, water, because the ongoing quality and availability of it is, is critical to life, to the production of food, and therefore to a nutrition, health, and wellness company. Without water, there is no sustainability for our company and for our shareholders, no doubt. Rural development, because of the overall well-being of the farmers, especially the smallholders, 
Rural communities, workers, small entrepreneurs, and suppliers are intrinsic to our ability to continue to do business in the future. And nutrition, because food and nutrition are the basis of health, it is the basis of our own business. It is the reason, nutrition is the reason why Nestle exists. As I hope to demonstrate, each of these has a particular relevance also to your institute's mission, which is to achieve sustainable food security and to reduce poverty in developing countries. Let me turn first to water. I think this has to be our chief priority. The continued availability of water is key to our continued ability to grow and to serve the consumer's needs all over the world. Without water, there is no food. And without water and food, there is no human life. We are making constant progress, both in reducing the quantity we extract and in ensuring the quality of what we put back into the environment. Just to give you one figure, only last year we saved 10 million cubic meters of water worldwide. We also continued our commitment to build water treatment facility wherever insufficient uh, municipal ones exist around our planets. And this is not something we started to invent now. Our first water treatment plant was built in 1930 in uh, Switzerland. And we installed our first treatment plants in Brazil, for example, 12 years before there was any legislation requiring companies to do so. But this is what we are doing internally. And you see the results about here. But I don't think this is enough. In addition to our own direct operations, we are actively helping to manage water in the supply chain. And moreover, we are vocal advocates for the need for multi-stakeholder action on water. Examples of this include our work with the World Economic Forum and the UN Global Compact's CEO water mandate to move the water up on the global agenda. And our active participation in the recent 2030 Water Resources Group report called Chartering Our Water Future. For anybody who had the opportunity, and I only invite you to look at it, it is one of the most comprehensive attempts to date to examine not only the cross-sectional water challenges, but also to propose costed and factual solutions. Turning to, other, to the other key creating shared value focus, which is rural development, and one of which I'm sure is also of high interest to you, Nestle does not own agricultural land. But what Nestle does, it has one of the largest private efforts to help farmers to be more productive and climb out of poverty. We provide today more than 600,000 farmers many of whom, by the way, are women, with free advice, technical assistance, over 30 million in microcredit per year, and very importantly, for the children of those farmers, basic education, including rural schools where they are not available. This is to help them produce greater yields of higher quality crops while conserving precious water, benefiting the environment, and increasing their income. As a result of this, and our 460 factories, whole regions and rural areas gain from wider employment and economic development opportunities. That's good for society. What's so good for us? Well, for good for us is that we can assure our consumers that the agricultural raw materials used in our products are safe, are of high quality, and are produced using sustainable agricultural practices. And this becomes a very important argument vis-a-vis -vis our consumers to make a positive choice vis-a-vis -vis them. Every day, we need 1,300,000,000 decisions for one of Nestle's products to get to our turnover. So every single day, this becomes more and more important that people have the confidence and the trust in our company that the raw materials we are using coming from the sinks are produced in a sustainable 
way, and they are also produced in an ethical manner. And Nestle is just one stakeholder among many in the area of food security, and we have and we seek to work together with other major uh, stakeholders, whether they are governments, NGOs, FAO, IFPRE, agricultural institutes, farm organizations, in helping to address what we believe to be one of the most serious and basic problems facing us tomorrow. How are we going to feed this world in the next 25 to 50 years? Over the decades, we have helped millions of milk and coffee farmers to become better suppliers, and in this way, to overcome poverty and advance economically. Again, this is not from now. This started many, many years ago. We first arrived in Brazil and South Africa, for example, in the 1920s. We identified a ready market. We identified a commercially attractive market for safe quality milk products and invested not only in the industrial infrastructure to process this fragile commodity and bring it to population centers far from the sources of where milk is being produced. But more importantly, perhaps, we also brought with us the Swiss Milk Collection District System, which had been pioneered in the Swiss Alps with the Swiss farmers operating in correspondingly challenging conditions. And the result was <coughs> sorry, that we were able to assure the quality and quantity of our supply despite numerous social and geographical challenges. The boat you see here, for example, comes from the first experience we had in Venezuela. There was no road, there was no rail, there was nothing. The only thing there was a river on which the farmers could bring, for example, the milk to the factory. And the other side is uh, our first factory in the north in the Mongolia of, of China. So we have been able to, the result was that we were able to assure that the quality and the quantity of our supply has been assured and both farmers and Nestle thrived over times. And here I would like to emphasize the long-term nature and the importance of long-term nature of the shared benefit. From the humble beginnings in 1920, just to give you one example, our Brazilian milk district today is bigger than all of Switzerland. That's the size of today that we have been working. And meanwhile, our learning of milk districts have been replicated in more than 30 countries around the world, from India to Philippines, from Colombia to Chile, and from South Africa to Morocco. And the most recently, we've done the same effort in Uganda, Kenya, and the last one is now Rwanda. So our creating shared value impact on rural communities is not restricted to our milk districts, of course. Globally, most of our 460-odd factories are situated in rural areas in developing countries. And they have a far-reaching influence on family incomes, on the quality of life of the people who live in the area, and on the future of the next generation. One of the creating shared value commitments in rural development we made during the past year, and one that's especially relevant in the context of food policy and food security, it is we are building more and more regional development centers, especially <coughs> in developing countries like this one here in uh, Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire. Among other activities, the center will concentrate on research into improving the yield and productivity of indigenous agricultural raw materials and produce. It's not enough that we do that just for international commodities like, for example, milk, but also for local ones. For example, a well-established project on sustainable cassava growing is one example. More recently, a three-year project to reduce, to reduce mycotoxin contamination levels in cereal grains and, leg and, and legumes, beans and peas, was launched in Ivory Coast, Ghana and Nigeria, and will be progressed via this regional development center. And the biggest impact is going to be in cocoa. Through the work of this center, in conjunction with our Nestle science-based plant in Tour France, we will, con we will distribute, free of charge, one million high-yield cocoa plantlets each year going forward from 2012 in order to replant the whole cocoa plantations in the area 
of Ivory Coast and Ghana, which have, the yields have been coming down because the plants are all too old. And then, in addition to its working in Ivory Coast, Nestle is training plant scientists in other cocoa producing countries, such as Indonesia and Ecuador, in accelerated cocoa tree propagation. Now, let's move to the third one, which is nutrition. The factory you can see here is at a place called Faira de Santana in the economically very challenging northeast region of Brazil. It provides 125 jobs directly and many more to the suppliers and contractors who work with Nestle in this region. The initial cost was 60 million Swiss francs and it was the first Nestle factory to be conceived and designed in produce, for producing what we call popularly positioned products, which are products which are specifically formulated and packaged to provide great taste and nutrition at prices that are affordable for the poorer parts of a population like the one that is predominating in northeast of Brazil. Many of these products are nutritionally fortified, which brings an essential benefit to the end consumer. But there is one more important benefit in the case of popular reposition products. Consumers in the segments for which these products are designed cannot be reached via hypermarkets or via supermarkets. They cannot be reached via the Walmarts or the Targets. They can only be reached through mom and pop shops in the neighborhoods or even by door-to-door -door delivery. And this has a consequence that over the past couple of years, we have created more than 6,000 jobs in Brazil alone, mostly among women, as part of a scheme which we call Nestle a Devose, where we are bringing these products to every single household in these neighborhoods. And by providing microfinance, uniforms, and pushcarts for those micro-entrepreneurs, as I said, the big majority of them are women. But we also do this in many other countries around the world, selling, for example, affordable fortified milk or fortified Maggi products. And by the end of 2009, we had launched such products in over 60 countries, from Sri Lanka to Guinea, bringing 17 billion, just to give you one, 17 billion servings of affordable milk products fortified with micronutrients that are present in insufficient quantities in local diets to consumers in an accessible way and generating income for distributors in this process. Again, very interesting combination between the creating value for the society, giving jobs for people who would never have a job. At the same time, of course, it's good business for our shareholder. And staying with nutrition, we also want to share our nutrition expertise with organizations helping children to improve their nutrition and physical activity. So we have created the Nestle Healthy Kids Global Program, which aims to have a nutrition education or physical activity program in every one of the 120 countries where Nestle has a company of its own. We now reach about 10 million children through 30 such programs worldwide, and that number should at least double in the next years. And they will always share <coughs> expertise that we have learned through partnerships in other parts of the world. Like, for example, EPODE. EPODE stands for Ensemble Prevenant l'Obesité des Enfants, which was an initiative 15 years ago launched by the French government, which was trying to find a way uh, to help to overcome the obesity issue in French children. Today, this project is being reaches 2.5 million children in hundreds of towns in France, Spain, and Belgium. And it's very clear there's not one size fits for all. Every single of this program and every single of the country has to be tailor-made, needs the involvement of our local nutritionists. And therefore, you will see, for example, that we have many of those programs, such as Healthy Thai Kids, a program in conjunction with the Minister of Public Health and Education that has already reached in its first year 10,000 schools throughout Thailand. But do we do all these initiatives in nutrition, water, and rural development to be charitable? No. 
And that was a very clear uh, uh, start from the beginning. No, we do it and we did it because it makes sound business sense. We don't do philanthropy. And that was makes this program so different. That's what makes this program so sustainable. Because this is part of a business strategy. It's a tremendous opportunity for us, provided we get our product offering right with those consumers. I think it's also a powerful example of how we are tangibly creating value for the people and we interact and we at the very stage in the value chain that we can grow our business at the same time. Now, let me say that vis-a-vis -vis this part of the business, there's another one which is the shareholder part. And this is what we call the Nestle model, a model which I have given to our company. This is now the financial part of it. We are doing this in order to be able to grow our business 5 to 6% internal growth every single year, but at the same time to further improve our EBIT margin, to have more profit, not less profit, to improve the capital efficiency and the business return on invested capital and resulting in an industry outperforming long-term total shareholder return. So all what I have told you before is part of the tools that we're using in order to achieve this part of the business, the financial part of it, which is the shareholder value part of it. And those are the results. Over the last 10 years, as you can see, we have achieved an organic growth, internal growth, this, is, this includes acquisition, which come on top of it, of 6.2%. Now, our market is growing by about 1.7%. So we have more than tripled outperform the growth of our industry and still at the same time creating so much value for society. We have improved the EBITDA margin, as you can see here from our company, from 11.8 to 14.6% at the same time. And I think this is a clear sign that this model works on both sides. And we also look, of course, which is also very important, which is what is the image of our company. So we are checking all over the world constantly. What are people thinking about Nestle's compliance, about Nestle's role, about Nestor's responsibility as a corporate citizen. And you can see here also, we have strengthened our performance in the eyes of our stakeholders by conscientiously and consistently updating our compliance against the most recent and relevant norms, and by taking an equally painstaking approach to our performance in environmental sustainability, and by incorporating creating shared value concept into our long-term business strategy. You see here, and we are quite open, we have still work to be done. But if I would show you this, the same picture about five years ago, you would see that we had a, quite a, a big amount of negative sides, starting by the USA, for example. UK, very strongly. Sweden, Australia. They were all very negative. Today, we still have Great Britain, slightly negative, and we have Italy. The reason for Italy is because there was a an, an, an contamination issue, and therefore the, Im the impact of safe products is, uh, has negative impact on public opinion. But you can see here how strong the public opinion is, for example, in the developing countries uh, where we have implemented the creating shared value concept first. Now, where did this creating shared value concept come? It was developed jointly with Harvard professor Michael Port and Mark Kramer. And the concept was first articulated in the award-winning 2006 Harvard Business Review article on competitive advantage and corporate responsibility. And I had just came back from my experience from Davos, and I read then later on this article by, by Michael Porter. And on building on that, we invited Porter and Kramer to go and to analyze Nestle's business in Latin America and to produce a report on what they were seeing and how this concept could become perhaps an, a new concept that would be valid for our company as a whole. And there was, the study confirmed our idea about, corporate, uh, about creating shared value, 
but it also indicated that there was a need for measurement of the results. That was, in the beginning, the first, I would say, critic that we received on the concept that people felt that, well, this sounds very nice, and you can basically define everything, but you have to find something. If you're talking on the financial terms, you have a balance sheet, you have a profit and loss account. What do you have on the second side of the concept? What, what are the measurements that you have, the key performance indicator? Okay? And therefore, we initiated a multi-year plan that enables us now to measure creating shared value more precisely and extensively. And I invite you to take a look at our current creating shared value report, which I think we're out, out there. And you will see on the, on the first pages inside, you will see the first key performance indicator that we have elaborated together with the Leeds University in the UK. And uh, on March 16th, you will be able to see a whole new set of key performance indicators in our 2009 report which will be available via our corporate uh, website at uh, www.nestle.com, uh, creating shared value. So that is now the big, the big challenge that we have now, is to really establish a measurement system, which then afterwards allow to prove how many value has been created for society, how many value has been created for the, uh, for the shareholders. As we have seen, creating shared value is a basic, principle, uh, is a basic business principle not a philanthropy and not an add-on. And to help to promote more widely the adaptation of this approach to doing business, in April last year, we co-sponsored the first Creating Shared Value Forum along with the UN Office for Partnerships and the Swiss Mission to the UN. The discussion of how a company's long-term business strategy can profitably incorporate the concept of shared value generated a great deal of excitement among our global audience, we had webcasted it directly with about 1,500 people participating. And now I come back uh, to my first uh, mentioning why I said I'm very close to this institute, because part of that appeal had to do with the quality of the 13-person advisory board of world experts that we have assembled to guide our creating shared value strategy, and including are such luminaries as your own esteemed former Director General uh, Joachim von Braun. It is Howard's Michael Porter, Ziki Prahalat, uh, whom many of you might know. He was the author of The Fortune at the Base of the Pyramid, Columbia University's Jeffrey Sachs, and many more, as you can see from here. And their sharp insights give us all plenty to think about as we chart our journey of creating shared value. But we didn't just talk in New York. We made our own concrete commitments aimed at creating new partnerships with governments, NGOs, and small enterprises, and launched three important new initiatives. Two of them I've already mentioned. One was the Regional Development Center in Abidjan, Ivory Coast, and the second one was this Nestle Healthy Kids Global Program for 100 million of children. The third one, um, the third one is the creation of the Nestle Prize in creating shared value, which will award financial support of up to 500,000 Swiss francs to individuals, NGOs, or small enterprises, which are offering innovative solutions either to nutritional deficiencies or access to clean water, or progress in rural development. And Nestle will award the prize every two years, starting in May of this year. In two months, we are going to announce the first. Let me just tell you, we launched this in April. In December, we had the, the, already the selection process, and we had 550 uh, candidates for this prize in the first six months of the existence. These three new initiatives, the Nestle Healthy Kids Program, the Nestle Prize in Creating Shared Value, and the new uh, Regional Development Center in Abidjan, all of them with the direct relevance to food security, come against the backdrop of a deep economic recession with destruction of value for both shareholders and the public of historic 
proportions. But we announce these initiatives in the middle of the crisis because we believe that the financial and ensuing economic crisis revealed once more a basic business axiom. If you fail to work on behalf of the public interest and you start to take shortcuts that place the public at risk, you will also fail to your shareholders. The positive reaction we have received concerning these commitments has shown us the world is thirsty for new ideas in these fields that are above all doable and practical. And civil society is increasingly eager to dialogue intelligently, sensibly, and sensitively to share and to develop those ideas. It was this openness to dialogue on the part of the UN agencies, NGOs, and global experts that was for me one of the most encouraging outcomes of our meeting in New York. And this has been replicated in regional forums which we have since run, partnering with local UN and other civil society organizations to host events in Brazil and Mexico, amongst others. And in other cases, such as what you also participated in as institute, the first FAO private sector summit, which I co-chaired last year in Milan, it was quite clear that the three focus area we have chosen for our creating shared value approach, nutrition, water, and rural development, all intersect in the context of the food security issue. You cannot solve the world's nutrition issues if you do not secure sustainable agricultural supply through rural development. And you cannot achieve sustainable rural development until you solve the crisis of water and agriculture, and within agriculture, especially the problems of the small farmers. Speaking for Nestle, I can say that we are committed to do our utmost to influence each of these areas for joint benefit of the societies where we operate, and by assuring our own ability to continue to grow for the benefit of our shareholders too. In closing, it has been clear from our engagement to date that while no single company can solve the entire world's problem, every com company can and has to make an impact along its own unique value chain in a way that is sustainable and no less important, it has to be also justifiable and beneficial to its shareholders. I'm hopeful that we have reached a watershed moment in our collective thinking about traditional corporate social responsibility on the one hand and creating shared value on the other hand. 